morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Breakfast at UM Health. I am phone moderator of these sections. First, let me introduce the speaker, Dr. Hong Wei Han. Dr. Hong obtained a PhD in medical education, currently senior lecturer at Murdu, and leads the management of uh, U UM MBBS curriculum. This makes her the perfect person to speak on today's topic, that is designing interactive lectures. During her talk later, you are welcome to share your thoughts or questions in the Q&A box. We'll go through that at the end of the session. Without further ado, I invite Dr. Hong to begin her talk. Thank you very much, Hong. A very good morning, I bid to colleagues at UM Health. Um, this very morning, I'm going to get all of you to do a little bit of reflection first thing in the morning. So my talk is on designing interactive lectures, which are totally relatable to anyone in this faculty, uh, also possibly to new lecturers who have just joined us, um, looking at the volume of students that we are getting both at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, I hope that this session will be beneficial to everyone. So let us get started. Okay, so I'm going to give you an outline of what we are going to talk about this morning. First and foremost, I'll get all of us here to reflect on our own practices. And then we'll move on to what are our challenges as teachers nowadays. And we did some survey with our students on what they really think about their lectures and certainly on how we can improve. Um, let me share with you that from our uh, feedback from the students, we actually have a lot of exemplary teachers at the faculty. Um, so it's not just limited to what I'm going to present today. Uh, there are some name lecturers, in fact, and uh, please feel free to drop by at Murdu. We will certainly tell you who they are and you can approach them if you think that you want to learn more from them. Yeah. Okay, so our first uh, practice today here, we are going to reflect on our own practice today um, on the purpose of a lecture. Okay, so think back of a lecture that we have um, prepared. Whether is it for us to cover the content within the 60 minutes and that's our job. Think about it and see. Uh, most of us actually doing it just to cover the 60 minutes given. Or do you really want our students to get the message that you are trying to present to them? Okay. The second point here is whether giving a lecture, is it a form of instruction? Uh, being in a very Asian context, it's, it's sad to see our classrooms, usually our students would be very quiet. Um, lecturers find it very challenging to ask questions because students would then stay quiet. So to this uh, session, we want to try to brainstorm with each other how else we can encourage our students to speak up, how else we want to encourage them to talk in the classroom and allow them to talk more than we do in the classroom. Okay. The third point here to reflect is that whether good feedback that we have obtained from students, does that mean that learning has really occurred, right? So, in the feedback that we get from our students, we see, oh, okay, they think that they, they can understand the course, they can follow through, no issues. And then when it's assessment, you find that, oh dear, our students actually don't understand what we were trying to tell them. So think about whether are they giving us the feedback just for the sake of the feedback, or do we really need to reflect on our own practices? which is very common for granted, yeah, that students understand all that we have said in the lecture if they don't ask any questions. And I think this also happens to me if I ask them, guys, do you have any question? And if they stay quiet, I take it as no question, all good, right? So whether is that something that we can think about how we can do better in trying to get them to really catch the message that we are trying to deliver within an hour of lecture in the classroom. And uh, the fifth point that we possibly could reflect today is whether a silent class means the students are attentive and interested. Yeah, Especially if we are teaching a group of 180 undergraduate students I think uh, we won't be able to know them uh, by their names unless if they put a play card. I do know that 
we have lecturers who actually go all out to prepare play cards for the students to put their names in front. And each session, it makes it easier for him to actually call out the students to ensure that they are attentive and they are uh, on the same page as him. Yeah. So there are certain practices that we can actually uh follow, we can actually learn from each another to ensure our class remain interactive. Okay. So here are some of our challenges as teachers, and I'm sure um, the list can go can still go on. Yeah. These are just some of our challenges as teachers that I would like to point out in this morning's discussion. And uh, I think uh, many of us here in uh, UM Health would would be able to add on to this list, yeah? So I would like to draw your attention to the first point here on the average attention span. So I assure you that I won't take more than uh, the time allocated because the average attention span is less than 30 minutes, yeah? Um, and there are actually a lot of distractions in the classroom. Doesn't matter um, whether it's going to be on the teacher's end or the student's side. There may be phone calls coming in there will be notifications on the phone that, you know, it comes popping on your phone and you get distracted. The students get distracted. They will then look at their phone and they probably don't follow through the lecture. Okay. And um, many times we have heard colleagues saying that I have so much to teach, but I only have one hour. Too much to teach and too little time. Hmm. All right. So these are our challenges as well. We want the students to know everything. And there is a constant need for instant gratification nowadays. Um, students being students, I think I was once this kind of student as well. When we enter lecture hall, we expect lecturers to tell me what I need to know. Let me know what is important. Yeah, And uh, we, I, I don't deny that this is the case. Uh, having said that, our students have very long learning hours. Um, if we look at their timetable, most of the courses here, we have uh, learning time that starts from 8 o'clock in the morning, stretch right up to 5 in the evening. So that's really long learning hours every day for them. And hence, we start seeing very low attendance rate in lecture halls, Yeah, particularly when students uh, do know that uh, it's not compulsory to attend large lectures. But it's, it's strange though, because um, we have done a small survey with our students randomly. Um, I'll tell you what they say. It's strange, although the attendance rate seems to be pretty low in some classes, uh, but exciting enough to know that they are still very interested in seeing you face to face, okay? So I'm going to share this um, findings with um, colleagues who are with us this morning here. Um, we, we ask very general questions yeah, to students and we ask questions like, um, are you still interested in attending lectures? You know, after COVID, students may think that online work better. Why do I have to come back to face-to-face -face lectures? And interesting enough, we see a 53% saying yes. And there are a big percentage of 40.9% saying sometimes. So what triggered me when uh, I saw this number here is that how can we convert this 40.9% into the yes category, you know? So if there is a sometimes in their mind, how, how we can target this group so that we can do better, yeah, from the teacher's point of view? And... Uh, I've also asked if uh, students prefer pre-recorded lectures over live sessions because a majority of them would have experienced uh, pre-recorded lectures uh, prior uh, during COVID and post-COVID, some of the sessions are still conducted uh, pre-recorded. Uh, but in the recent years, especially since last year, uh, it was compulsory to come back uh, for face-to-face -face sessions and um, Surprisingly, students actually say no to pre-recorded lectures. So 62.1% actually say no to pre-recorded lectures. Uh, but we're not saying that this is not the way forward. This probably can uh, fit as a supplementary uh, or preliminary materials for them to uh, look at before they come in for the classes. So it, it shows that they still do like uh, the live sessions, they like to come and see our lecturers face-to-face. -face. 
Okay. And um, we also did ask the students, would you attend the, les uh, the lectures if it is interactive? And a huge majority, 87.9% of them say, yes, they will attend if it is interactive. So I think as teachers here, it, it got me thinking that um, perhaps there are some improvement that as a teacher, I could do more to ensure that uh, students will take the trouble to come and listen to our talk that morning. I mean, after all the effort that we have put in to prepare for the lecture, we hope that the lecture hall is full with students that will benefit out of our knowledge transfer. Yeah. So from this small survey, we can conclude that students actually do want to attend lecture and they do want to see you face to face. Yeah, they really appreciate the face to face sessions uh, rather than the online session. But having said that, I personally think that the online materials can be put uh, prior put up prior to the sessions so that students can take a look at it. Whether they take a look at it or not, it's really their own prerogative because they are adult learners. Okay. Interestingly, I came across this statement from Neil that saying that variability in student attention arises from differences between teachers and not from the teaching format itself. So regardless what sort of teaching format, whether we are going to do it in a large lecture, a seminar, or whether we want to do small group teaching, it doesn't matter. But what we really want to capture would be the student's attention and whether the knowledge transfer actually happens or not. Okay, so I'll move on to the next point here on uh, what can I do to improve my lecture, all right? So uh, this is a sharing session and I'm sure colleagues out there, you would also have very good ideas that you want to share um, on how you can improve your lecture. But essentially, we are sharing points here that have been taken from feedback we have uh, uh, obtained from our undergraduate students from our postgraduate students as well, and uh, from our personal observation, as well as from literature on how else we can improve. Okay, so point number one here is to keep our talk concise and enlightening, yeah? So I like to watch TED Talks, and I'm sure many of you do also. There is an 18 minutes rule of presentation where we deliver whatever you want to say in a very concise and enlightening manner in 18 minutes, yeah? Um, and that's typically for a one hour session, do it in 18 minutes, but we encourage questions from students. So get students to ask us, uh, get them uh, to be interactive in the classroom. And I'll share with you some other tools that we possibly could use. I think it's very important to also use uh, pause, yeah? Um, have mindfulness break. Um, in many of our feedback, uh, students actually do note that they need breaks in between, maybe like a five minutes break for them to stretch out, yeah? And also share relevant case studies or real world examples uh, for them to understand complex concepts better. I think this is uh, essential, especially when we talk about uh, clinical or any medical related topics that needs uh, the lecturers to share real scenarios that has happened and how this potentially could be relevant to the topic that is being delivered and add some humor. Um, I'm not saying that we should be clowns, but uh, adding some humor here and there would help lighten up the classroom a little bit. Yeah, um, I think we are very, very mindful about our students' mental well-being. They sometimes find it very afraid to speak to our lecturers because they find some lecturers quite scary. Yeah. Um, I think we need to empower them more and uh, allow them to speak up in the classroom. It's very typical of them to be very quiet. Yeah. And I'm sure many of us here knows that the use of videos would hold attention. Yeah. So Use snippets from interesting videos. Um, I've seen before um, colleagues who have used videos which students have done in previous uh, learning sessions and she actually uses them to uh, tell the current students what the seniors have done before and some of them were funny, but, but you know there were learning points in the videos that students could pick up 
Yeah, uh, you could incorporate real world examples, and uh, the points that had asterisks on it were actually uh, very much highlighted in feedback that we have obtained from students. Yeah, so uh, incorporate real world examples, uh, phenomena, and uh, video clips as much as you can here and there. I'm not saying that the whole presentation has to have video, but perhaps one video, short video in any of your presentation. It doesn't have to be all of the presentation, yeah? Because some can be uh, very, very uh, knowledge-based, yeah? And we truly understand that. So the third point here is to take students' interest into account. Now, um, I think the emerging point that came out from students' feedback was that they didn't know what the talk was all about. And that actually got me thinking that I should outline what I want to speak in today's talk as well. Otherwise, uh, my, my audience will be thinking, okay, so what are we going to do today? And what are we going to talk about? And what are we going to reflect today? So the outline of the talk is very important so that students know what to expect. Yeah, um, I think it's also important to explore students' prior knowledge. I do know that our colleagues here... Um, load their materials online for students reading prior to attending the, uh, to the classes. Well, I must say that not all of them actually read before entering the class, but there are a handful of students who actually take note of the uh, materials being uploaded and they do read before coming in. Okay, there are students who really do that. And I would like to also share this strategy, the think, pair, and share strategy, where we could get uh, students to work in pairs. If it is a large group, you can get them to, to speak out in the class. And I think it's a very Asian thing that they don't want to speak out. Uh, you can get them to think of a question and then speak to the friend next to them and then get them to volunteer to share what are their thoughts or you can pick out anyone to share their thoughts in the classroom. And I think this is fairly common. Uh, we can also evaluate their engagement levels by asking questions. Yeah, and I, I think the idea of having the, uh, the name tags uh, on the table is very useful, especially in large groups where we can't recognize the students, we don't really remember their names. Um, we can get that to ask uh, students uh, some questions that were relevant to what you have just spoke about yeah, in the classroom and certainly to empower students. Um, I think many of our colleagues here would agree that students actually are very, very resourceful. Uh, they, many of them actually do their own learning prior to entering to our class or even if they don't, after our class, they actually will take the trouble to go and find out more and they are actually very, very proactive. Mm -hmm. um, especially you can see through when you get them to do any other projects, they are actually very resourceful. It's probably only in the lectures where, you know, they are just being very shy to speak out. But that's where we as teachers, we can step in and encourage them to speak in the classroom. Let them speak their mind and we then facilitate the discussion. Yeah, and I think very importantly is to have reasonable number of slides. I can't emphasize this more. Um, I can't believe uh, some of the sessions that is meant for 60 minutes actually had 120 slides and that's scary. Okay, I just can't imagine uh, how students are going to digest the information. They probably will end up being clueless about what the topic is about, okay? So I, I think as uh, teachers, we need to be very mindful that our students would probably start from ground zero. So be very mindful that we have to have reasonable number of slides so that we do not have the cognitive overload in them within that one hour, yeah? Then they will totally switch off from our session, definitely. So for that, uh, that would be very helpful to help us to organize uh, the session for more clarity and easy understanding. We can also use graphical representations to enhance our presentation. Um, we can use uh, clearer and engaging visuals, pictures or animations and also templates. Um, if you see my slides today, I actually use some templates uh, <laughs> and um, this is to avoid monotony, yeah? So that students don't see, oh, okay, it's just full of words again. It's boring, yeah? So 
get them uh, on their toes, uh, we can also learn from students. Actually, there are a lot of uh, teaching and learning tips and tricks that I learned from students as well. I think they are very good presenters. Yeah, They know the latest tool to use. Um, I must declare that I'm not very, very technology savvy, but some of the students actually taught me how to use some of the tools, okay? So how else? How else we can enhance our class? If whatever points that I've put forward earlier, you think that, yeah, I've tried all of them. How else? How else I can enhance my classroom? How can I make it more interactive? Okay, try out different presentation tools. PowerPoint, too boring. Okay, throw it out of the window. Use Prezi instead, all right? But please be mindful that some of these presentation tools that I'm sharing here will involve movement and animation. So I've also got feedback from some colleagues to say that it's very... Uh, Hideki, you, you know, there's a lot of movement. I can't take it. So really, it's a very personal preference. Um, you can actually tone down the movement. So some of these presentation tools here do have a lot of animation and movement, such as Prezi, uh, Canva, and Visme. You can try this out. They are interesting. Uh, you don't have to use the paid version first. You can try out the free version. And if you really like it, then you can subscribe to their templates as well as their uh, platform. Um, this is interesting. I find that this was the thing that really worked in my class. Yeah, Use interactive elements because our students don't like to volunteer to answer questions. So what I did was that I make smartphone my best friend. So I get them to hold on to their smartphone. All right. And many of these interactive elements are available online where you can even incorporate it into PowerPoint. And I'm sure uh, some of us here would even know that um, there are Slido that you can do polls inside PowerPoint. Yeah. So it comes out like real time. You don't have to exit PowerPoint and then you go into another application to see your poll. So you can actually incorporate it into uh, your PowerPoint itself. So here, uh, I find it interactive because uh, we can get students to brainstorm where they can insert uh, a one word or a phrase or even choose from multiple uh, questions on, a, uh, on Mentimeter. You can use poll everywhere. You can even use Google Form if you want to. Uh, if you find it more useful. And I find that this uh, interactive element is very useful, especially when it is in a large group teaching. Yeah, uh, Students love quizzes. From the feedback that we have obtained, classes with quizzes usually will uh, get very high rating because they appreciate the um, effort that lecturers put in uh, to come up with the quizzes. Uh, they find that it's interesting because it gets to test whether they understand their knowledge or not. Yeah. Uh, they get to respond, but not in a big class. They, they get to respond, but it's through quizzes. It's through all these uh, tools that is anonymous. So you don't really know who is responding, but you do get the number of respondents. So if you have a class of 160 students, you should by right get, if you get 150 respondents, that's already very good. The other 10, they probably are trying to play tricks and not, answer yeah and uh, q and a sessions does happen it does happen in a lot of classes but as um, we can see many of our students will just remain very quiet so i would suggest use the smartphone and you know get them to answer using their smartphone they probably will be happier doing that yeah okay so i found this japanese proverb and i find that um Whatever said and done, yeah, better than a thousand days of diligent study is one day with a great teacher. And I'm sure all of you here will be a great teacher to your students because I have learned from a lot, a lot of great teachers. And um, hopefully uh, we will do better for our students. Uh, our students nowadays, uh, we have to acknowledge that they are a very different generation, very technology savvy generation. Uh, generation. So um, I think as teachers, I have to keep up with the, uh, the, the whatever tools which are available out there. And I hope that today's session would give you a very uh, 
uh, informative session about how we can tackle students best in our future lectures uh, coming up in the new academic session. All right. So these are the references that I've used for my session. And I uh, thank you very much for being uh, attentive and still tuning in. Wow, we still have the same number of participants. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hong, for your very uh, interesting and informative sharings of how we can design interactive uh, lectures. Um, in the Q and A, we have uh, two questions. Uh, I mean, uh, would you uh, would you be able to um, check the questions? Uh, yes, Fong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fong. Um, I I let me read. Ah. Uh. Okay, so a uh, very uh thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, Chan, Prof. Y K Chan has said, uh, what are your thoughts about planting questions in the participants so that someone breaks that barrier from being shy? I notice once that barrier is overcome, the questions will come. Yes, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Chan, I think I certainly agree with um, uh, your thoughts here, and I I can't emphasize. Uh, enough how important is it to throw questions at students, let them think about uh, the questions right at the beginning, even before we start the lecture, so that it gets them thinking. And uh, knowing the audience is also important. Um, if we appear to be a little bit friendly to the students, I think they will be less... Uh, uh, that there will be less uh, barrier between us and the students, so they are more comfortable in answering us as well. I think the key thing here, and I've learned this from my teacher, is that it doesn't matter if they have answered wrongly, because this is a learning session for them as well. And as teachers, we have to be very tactful in uh, overcoming uh, or... or um, shaming them in the class yeah perhaps what we can do is that oh okay that's a very good answer but what about another perspective you know get them to think at another perspective and i i certainly think that with that approach it will open up um student other students to answering in the classroom putting in their their other ideas that we probably have not even thought about yeah thank you very much prof chan for that uh that thought there so Another question from an anonymous attendee. Very senior lecturers have difficulties to use digital presentations like PowerPoint. When they are forced to use these digital materials, their skill to make students engaged and interactive is almost lost. I notice these senior lecturers are very engaging when they are lecturing in all ways. Would you please give a brief suggestion to make all way chalk and blackboard lecturing interactive? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for this point. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, I think uh, we have to move with times. Yeah, um, It is difficult to start using digital presentations and I do agree that uh, many uh, teachers actually struggle with preparing um, uh, an interactive PowerPoint. Yeah, um, I think what we could possibly do as teachers is that we embrace the technology and learn from the students. Um, there are also students who are quite willing to help to beautify your PowerPoint for you. Yeah, it takes time, it takes time. But um, as I've mentioned, it's a learning curve for everyone, uh, including me as well. Uh, I'm not a very tech savvy person at the beginning and um, I've learned a lot from students. I've actually tapped on some of our students and I say, do you know how to use these tools? And I get them to actually come help me, show me how to do it. And then I try it on, on my own. Um, I think at the beginning, it is difficult. Uh, but once you you have tried it one, once and you probably want to do it better the next round. And I think it just have to get started somewhere, somehow. Yeah, I think that the chalk and blackboard way is um, a little bit uh, um, difficult nowadays. Yeah, with so much for us to tell the students, we want them to see things, and that's where we also need to load with uh, pictures. Yeah, uh, interactive uh, materials like videos, so that 
the attention span is there. Yeah. So most importantly, we get the message across. Um, you can also have materials that is being uploaded for students for extra reading. So it doesn't have to be everything being presented within the session itself. Yeah. Don't put feed them, please. Yeah. Um, I've got. <laughs> Dr. Mohasmi, does Murdo offer service for interactive lecture presentation design? Uh, Dr. Mohasmi, sorry, we don't, but uh, we are happy to, to um, sit and go through with you. Yeah, uh, I certainly can do that with you if you would like to. Um, I'll suggest some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, tools that you can use and you can try out on your own. And if it suits you, then there you go. You can start doing it on your own. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I guess uh, in the interest of time, uh, Fong, would you like to wrap up? Um, yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, um, thanks everyone for staying. Yeah. Um, uh, um, we, we do discuss, I read that, I read that we, we do discuss about, I mean, technology, you know, I mean, uh, anyway, I, I believe that technology will not re replace us as, as, as great teachers. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's just uh, we, we, uh, we might need to, um, like, like what Dr. Hong say, uh, we need to go with time and we catch up some some technologies um, for the for the generations that we are teaching. And um, with that, that's all the sessions. And again, thank you everyone for staying.